legalizefreedom.com. Here I would like uh, briefly to compare what the parable of Brave New World with uh, another parable which was put forth more recently uh, in uh, George Orwell's book, 1984. I'm inclined to think that uh, the scientific dictatorships of the future, and I think they're going to be scientific dictatorships in many parts of the world, will be probably a good deal nearer to the Brave New World pattern uh, than to the uh, 1984 pattern. They will be a good deal nearer, not because of any humanitarian qualms in the scientific dictators, but simply because the Brave New World pattern is probably a good deal more efficient than the other. But if you can uh, get people to consent to the state of affairs in which they are living, the state of servitude, the state of being, well, it seems to me that the, the nature of the ultimate revolution with which we are now faced is precisely this, that we are in process of developing a whole series of techniques which uh, will enable the controlling oligarchy, who have always existed and presumably always will exist, uh, to get people actually to love their servitude. Uh, people can be made to enjoy a state of affairs which, by any decent standard, they ought not to enjoy. And uh, these uh, methods, I, I think, are a real refinement on the older methods of terror, because they combine methods of terror with methods of, of uh, acceptance. But then there are the various other methods which one can think of, uh, there is, for example, the uh, pharmacological method. This, this was one of the things I, I talked about in, in Brave New World. Uh, and uh, the result would be that, uh, uh, I mean, you can imagine a, a euphoric which would make people thoroughly happy even in the most abominable circumstances. I mean, they, these things are possible. Good evening. I'm Greg Moffat of LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com. And today I'd like to present a review of this book, COVID-19, The Great Reset. And this is by, forgive the pronunciation here, Klaus Schwab, perhaps, and Thierry Mallory. It might be, doesn't matter how you pronounce it. You can see the names right there. Now, this book is of particular interest to me uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it essentially uh, speaks about, in it, the authors speak about possible, desirable, envisioned world changes as they see it, uh, coming in the wake of the 2020 coronavirus crisis. Now, this book was written back in June, and it's now uh, the second half of September. This is a publish on demand volume that the authors say they will be updating on a regular basis. So this volume I have here may have some updated information which is somewhat different from what they put down on paper back in June. Okay, two main things. The Great Reset, this has been a phrase much bandied about in recent times with regard to uh, the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis, if indeed it's ever truly declared over because of Two different things there. One is it actually being over and two, us behaving like it's over. Two potentially different things. And a lot of people have seen this term Great Reset, not known what it refers to, where it comes from. And it's been picked up by a number of people and used in different contexts. So I thought it would be worth getting this volume uh, and getting it sort of from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Now, Klaus Schwab is the founder of the World Economic Forum that was founded back in 1971. And without going into great detail, I mean, they've got a website with an about section. You can go and have a look. But they're one of these organizations that span 
the world and lots of different um, disciplines and you know, government, governmental, non-governmental, all sorts of people involved. But they're basically they're one of these global change type organizations. And there's lots of those. And people are sometimes quite wary of them. Um, and uh, often as not, you know, with, with good reason. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the reason for looking at this volume today. Now, what a lot of people don't do is take the information put out by these global change um, foundations and organizations and actually really look in detail at what they're saying. They take it second hand, third hand, somewhere down the line and quite often it's been distorted and changed for good or ill from what was originally said. So I thought it'd be good to go to the source in this case. Now if you are a subscriber to the channel already uh, then you've probably seen one or more of the videos which I made um, uh, over recent months and they'll give you an idea of where I'm coming from in this essentially. So they've got titles like COVID-19, uh, what's really going on, COVID-19, four things to watch for, uh, COVID-19, where exactly is the pandemic. So if you check those out, uh, you'll get an idea, as I say, of my thinking as it was before I actually read this book. Now, the book essentially talks about uh, the, as I say, the, the envisaged, envisaged changes that could or may happen. Some are desirable, some are not, as the authors see it. Uh, the book starts really with uh, stating the obvious, I suppose, that um, a lot of us feel that there we're at a crossroads at the moment in terms of um, global affairs. And this crisis, whatever you think of the origin of it, that the causes, and by the way, none of that really matters in what I'm about to say. Um, then there, there certainly seems to be the vistas for change seem to have opened up uh, rapidly. And we've seen a lot of changes in the last few months to society. Um, again, many of them not uh, by any stretch of the imagination desirable, but some of which open up possibilities for future change that might be more positive. Um, in fact, the book does talk about different eras. They, they're, they're nothing if not, um, uh, what's the word, ambitious in their thinking, shall we say, these guys. And they talk about before uh, coronavirus and after coronavirus as two different um, eras, really. And that's certainly, that's, that's big thinking, because what that indicates is that they imagine that almost nothing will remain unchanged um, as a result of this. Um, I've made, in my videos and other um, talks, I've made the point, I've drawn parallels between what's happening with the coronavirus crisis and what happened in the wake of 9-11 uh, in terms of our you know, global reaction to it, how society was, and culture changed as a result and many of the changes that were instituted uh, in the name of security after 9-11 are still with us today. Um, there are people going through airports, taking off their belts, uh, giving up their water, taking their shoes off, having a full body scan and they don't really know why. Uh, yes, yeah, security, but they don't understand where it came from. Why the shoes? Why the belt? What, what was the origin of that? And I'm reminded, uh, I've been reminded many times in recent months of how there's nothing as um, permanent as temporary government measures. So we're already seeing uh, how we're being primed for a lot of the changes that have happened in the wake of the virus of those being semi-permanent or indeed permanent. Certainly, I don't hear much talk about exit strategies or, um, you know, end dates for things like that. So uh, I'm not optimistic that we'll be going back to business as usual anytime soon. And that's a key point made in the book. Uh, they think it is impossible for things to return to normal in, on any front. Um, they also make the point that the coronavirus crisis has as amplified and exacerbated changes, accelerated changes that were already underway. And these are changes in what I call three E's, economy, energy, environment, but there are other changes in society as well. And you know, our reliance on tech, um, our habit of like um, isolating ourselves and doing things on our own and getting lost in our internet worlds. Uh, so changes across those fronts uh, that were already in place to some extent this has definitely accelerated them. Uh, for example, um, they talk a lot about um, economic growth, and we've seen that. Been, that's been stuttering really since the uh, financial crisis of 07, 08, and governments have been unable to do anything really to get their economies growing again. And the authors are basically saying, is growth actually desirable? Do we want to do that? 
So they're seeing a post-growth society, um, but also uh, admitting that it's going to be very painful to get there and that we will probably choose the path of most resistance as collective societies in getting to that place. Now, I've done lots of shows in the past about the desirability of a less materialistic society. So I think it could be a good thing. But the main problem we have is that our modern world is set up. It relies on economic growth. It relies on ever expanding economies in order to function. So somehow we're going to have to see all the uh, many of the systems and ways of doing things that we took for granted cease to function and we'll have to replace them with something else. That What that looks like is really anybody's guess. And it's a question of how disorderly that gets. And the authors do say that they expect uh, societal disruption on a, on a big scale to be a necessary precursor for a lot of the changes that they're talking about. Um, <clears throat> um, as far as our everyday lives go, there's one huge dimension to how we do things now that impacts economic growth. Now, we saw when the lockdowns were instituted how people were not able to do so many of the things they normally do in terms of economic activity. So they were spending a lot less money and businesses were shuttered and there was we all know about the consequences of that. One thing that social distancing and mask wearing and all these other um some would say impediments to our daily lives and you are know, having to book tables in, in a bar now just to get a drink businesses closing earlier uh, lots of things that we still can't do anything involving large groups of people go to the cinema go to a concert go to the theater this is all reduced economic activity and i mentioned social distancing and things like that because this makes the social activity less agreeable. It basically makes people not want to do it. And loads of us, um, even when things have reopened up, um, I've spoken to lots of people who feel like this, they haven't returned to the places that have opened because they don't want to because the experience has changed. And the authors make the point that if something is so disagreeable, that then becomes a deterrent to doing it. Like you want to go to the cinema, but under what circumstances do you want to go? You want to go out for a meal, but does it, does it feel like, um, you know, having dinner in prison or something, you know, is the experience an agreeable one anymore or has it changed fundamentally? Um, and that's going to have an enormous impact on um, our behavior going forward and therefore on economic growth and whether we feel that we're personally involved or invested in any of the businesses that will be impacted, um, it will affect everyone because you can't have economic disruption on this scale and not affect everyone, even, even the super rich. Um, it will have an effect. Um, climate is mentioned a great deal in the book, specifically climate change and how the changes in our societies and in our behaviour have, uh, over the lockdown period, had a positive effect on climate. Though I did read um, a study somewhere that said it was vanishingly small and that the book actually here refers to it. Um, so the, the authors say here that the uh, gains or improvements in environmental conditions as a result of lockdowns was disappointingly small. And that gives gives us or anybody who's interested an idea of the scale of change that we needed to bring about the sort of um, improvements in the climate change situation that we are told are necessary. Uh, and for our survival, in fact, I mean, it's, it's not too extreme uh, to, that, it, it, to say that we are being told that. Um, another um, dimension of changing society that the authors refer to at length is automation. And... They're saying that amongst other things, uh, social distancing, just wanting to not have people all working together in factories and offices is going to result in accelerating the process of automation that's already underway. Needless to say, this will have a huge impact on employment, which was already employment figures were already poor and being massaged by governments uh, to make them look better. Obviously, there have been millions of people. The job losses as a result of this crisis have been absolutely staggering. Um, I think in one month like sort of 40 million people um lost their jobs in the us um there was a figure of in a similar time period of about 100 million people in india just not having jobs to go to anymore and of course the social safety net there is even worse than it is in the us so people are just looking at having no food and possibly having no shelter so if automation is relied on further and you know all the other 
um, things that we've gone to, uh, we, we're now doing online, which reduces the number of face-to-face -face interactions that we have. That again is going to um, make, make things more efficient, but it'll make them um, em uh, be employers of a lot less people. And that also ties in with perhaps what I said um, a moment ago about um, making experiences less agreeable. You know, some people would say, well, if I can do X, Y, and Z without interacting with a person, then that's a bonus. Okay, not everyone feels like that. Um, so uh, in terms of sectors in uh, the book, they refer to business sectors uh, that they expect to be impacted the most. Um, in terms of unemployment, I'd say it's worth just mentioning they, they single out the service industry as being particularly hard hit. You know, jobs in um, call centres, jobs in bars and restaurants and hotels. So going forward, they and basically say they don't expect a recovery in any of that at any time, really. Never mind any time soon, just any time. If you're in a service industry job at the moment and you're furloughed, you probably should have been thinking a while ago about looking at other options. Um, to industries that they did mention uh, as having potential going forward uh, are anything to do with health and wellness, not necessarily health care, you don't have to work for the health service, but anything to do with health and wellness and education. Um, oddly enough, even though um, a lot of that will be, I guess, done online and people can only learn so much from reading books or reading websites. So the person to person interaction will still be important um in those areas despite you know online doctoring and you know uh, various machines that they can hook you up to um to uh, diagnose your health or otherwise uh, people are still going to be important um in all of that um another industry that's going to be massively impacted has already of course is travel now we know all know why what happened in the lockdowns and what didn't happen during the lockdowns so again if you're in the travel industry if you haven't already think about your uh, think about your future um, because the landscape is going to look very, very different, I feel. Um, I think that um, travel is one of those things that free flowing travel where you just um, hop on a plane or you can book it fairly quickly and just fly to the far ends of the earth. It's only a question of money. That is either not going to be just flat out not possible for a number of reasons or it will become so disagreeable that you don't want to do it. I remember my first visit to an airport after 9-11. Um, it wasn't pleasant. I remember the first time that I went to the US after 9-11, the security at the airport made the whole thing um, deeply uh, disagreeable, in fact. So um, expect more of that. Uh, one of the things I identified in my video, um, COVID-19, four things to watch for, was universal basic income. And this is basically a form of dole, money handed to citizens instead of having a job. If things go on the way they are with unemployment uh, increasing and not coming back, increased automation, uh, look out for these schemes. And the authors mentioned this in the book. They said, is now the time for universal basic income to be rolled out across the board? Big problem with that, as I see it, is you're then relying um, even more on uh, the state uh, for your survival and all of that like any form of handout comes with um, strings attached and you can be sure that the number of strings attached will only increase in future reading the book uh, you do get to various points where uh, you ask yourself the question they haven't mentioned the virus itself uh, in this chapter or they're not really referring to it except in an oblique way, and does it actually really matter? So the book itself is really, uh, the, the tone of it is very much like, okay, we had the virus, we all know about that, it's, it's out of the way now, so now we're moving forward. What will the world look like post-pandemic when um, the media, mainstream media, are still very much focusing on uh, the pandemic as something that is happening right now, and we're right in the middle of it, and it's just about to get worse, by the way, second wave and all that. So there's a there's sort of a degree of fatalism about the book um, that, you know, all of this is inevitable. And that's one other thing that characterizes it, actually, which is a little odd, um, is it's a strange mix of certainty and uncertainty. Because 
often on the same page, sometimes even in the same paragraph, the authors say the following will happen. And then, uh, you know, a few lines later, nobody can know what will happen. <laughs> so that's slightly curious. It has one of those fait accompli coup d'etat sort of um, uh, dimensions to it where it's presenting, you know, this is its blueprint for the fu future, literally in this case, blue. Uh, but then sort of saying, you know, well, we cannot know when the uncertainties are our legion and, and, and everything else. So that's one thing that struck me was like, you know, the, the, the mix of certainty and uncertain, uncertainty. I would say if there was one takeaway from this, it's, which I've already mentioned several times, it's basically a growing power of the state. And the authors talk about even business now um, is going to have to toe the line. Business will have to come to heel with state intervention. Uh, this will be happening, perhaps, they're imagining it happening in countries and economies where it's currently unthinkable, almost. So government role is going to mushroom as far as the authors are concerned. Um, overall, if you're looking for, if you're coming from a, a certain direction in all of this, um, I would say a lot of it, because you probably, some people have probably already looked at this and read the description. Uh, by the way, the, the description from the back of the book, you'll find in the uh, the information section below this video and say this sounds a lot like a sort of new world order order type thing and if you um, look up new world order related um, theories and, and conspiracy theories whatever they happen to be a lot of this does slot neatly in with that so make of that what you will um, also there's an overlap with the 2030 sustainable development goals which again the authors refer to so it's very much not never let a crisis go to waste. And in the same way that in 9-11, a lot of people with their hands on the levers of power pounced on 9-11 as an opportunity to do things, certain things that they wanted to do or tried to do or started to do but couldn't get finished. So too, uh, this great reset is going to see a lot of changes that have been talked about for decades, for a long time, openly discussed, plans laid we must do this, we must get to this place, this has to change, struggling to get it done, and it's boom, you know, maybe in one fell swoop, or two birds with one stone, whatever, a whole bunch of birds, a whole flock of birds with one stone, uh, uh, changes can be pushed through um, in these unprecedented uh, circumstances. Um, equally, some of you will have seen the Zeitgeist movies, if you don't know anything about that, or indeed the Venus project if you just google zeitgeist movement or venus project so uh, what's presented in the, the world that's presented in the book post pandemic a sort of technocracy is very like the vision for future societies laid out by zeitgeist movement and to an extent the venus project which was zeitgeist uh, progenitor um localism all of this sounds like um in increasing globalism and increasing interdependence but uh, the authors do acknowledge that the, the trend towards localism, which has been necessary um, in the aftermath of the pandemic, you know, just shorter supply chains and doing more things locally, basically, because you can't go elsewhere, that that will probably continue as well. And that is pulling quite in the opposite direction to a lot of what um, I've been speaking about. A lot of the other ideas that are put forward in the book. And they do talk about, um, I, I've talked about it often with the potential upsides of that, you know, how good that would be. And the authors mainly focus on that um, as a negative. But anyway, it's a trend that's in place at the moment. And uh, I think it is set to increase. And that's everything from shopping locally, supporting local businesses um, and such like to so-called staycations, not traveling very far when you want a break because either you can't or you don't want to because the whole process is so bloody miserable. Uh, vaccines, of course, get a mention as well. Lots of people are already commenting, saying um, there can be no return to any sort of normality until a COVID-19 vaccine is delivered and scaled up so that pretty much everyone in the world can benefit from that. I mean, there's huge issues with that. One is the, you know, the issues of consent and also what constitutes <clears throat> a safe virus, sorry, a safe vaccine. Um, what happens is are the manufacturers going to be liable for side effects or is that going to be waived? There's also the issue of development time. The average development time for a safe vaccine at scale 
is over 10 years. The fastest it's ever been done is about four and a half years. So how they're talking about confidently having it, you know, by this winter or early next year, I'm not sure. Maybe that will happen. Um, I remain skeptical about that. I've already seen some articles saying, well, it wouldn't be a vaccine as such, but it will be a negative test would get you the green light to travel or to go to a concert, just a negative test. And that's something that can be done quite quickly. Not at the moment it can't because we're not being able to scale that up, but this is for the future. So that would sidestep the vaccine issue. So it wouldn't be like a case of you can't travel internationally unless you've been vaccinated. It would be, but you need a negative test that would expire, obviously, like any other travel document that uh, would have uh, limited life. Uh, they also obliquely mention, uh, sorry, not so much obliquely, but briefly mention the question of um, monitoring um, people's health in future. They talk about um, potentially um, implantable chips, uh, which could uh, give biofeedback. And also something that a bit like, if you call a bio bracelet, basically, biometric bracelet. So this would be a little bit like the things worn by prisoners who are out on release and basically track their movement 24 hours. They're not able to travel beyond a certain zone. Um, the bracelet lets the, in real time, lets the authorities know if they've broken their curfew or whatever it happens to be, their travel restrictions. So the same equipment can be adapted to give biofeedback. So that would be your heart rate, you know, and all sorts of other metrics to see if you're still well. Whether you'd be wearing one of those all the time, who knows, or whether you have to wear it when you travel. Again, it's just something that they mention uh, seemingly without controversy. They just um, pass over it. Um, one thing that did, there was one laugh out loud moment in the book because it's not particularly well um, written and it's certainly not a page turner. Uh, they do mention the uh, possibility of smart toilets in our era of smart everything. They mentioned smart toilets. Now, along the lines of the bio bracelet, I think you can tell how this is going to work. Basically, you would um, you would go and the toilet would then deliver biofeedback based on your waste. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, good luck with that. Um, I don't see that being uh, ruled out anytime soon. It's a bit like smart meters, you know, much talk about. We'd all have one um, day after tomorrow and, you know, uh, years later, I'm not even close to achieving that. Um what this, if that sounds like the, the bracelet idea and the smart toilet, if all this sounds very invasive and controlling, well, that's obviously what it is. And for good or ill, better or worse, richer or poor, whatever you think about the measures being taken to control the pandemic or a reaction to it and plan for the future, either way, it is about control. Um, and in the author's layout, just to the extent to which our lives um, are already being controlled in response to this and how that will increase, because it must increase. Uh, it's the only way to uh, keep on top of all this. Uh, one thing that I often reflect on, though, when they talk about global this and global that surveillance control is, you know, to what extent it's truly global, because we sitting in uh, modern developed Western countries have a habit of thinking that kind of we're it, that everyone in the world is like this, uh, lives like this, and everyone can be um, brought under surveillance and control in this way. But there are different situations in different countries and different populations live in different ways, uh, many of them quite primitive, even today, uh, compared to, to how we live. So, yeah, the system's not, it's not as, uh, the situation, I should say, not as black and white um, as you might uh, at first be led to believe. Um, they also devote a section of the book to the concept of the dystopian possibilities of all this. Now, of course, a lot of what I've already said has probably got you thinking along those lines. They do directly address it. It was a section called the risk of dystopia. So they're aware that the choices we make today uh, will affect future generations. Um, and so we need to be very careful in all of this about what we think of as necessary today and prudent and how sticky that might become and because again in the wake of 9-11 look how quickly people got used to the so-called new normal and people are already sort of starting to you know they've already said their fond farewells I think in psychologically to some of the, the ways that we used to do things my I spent years in the music industry and so many of my friends and colleagues and contacts around the world are still involved in it uh, in whatever level and certainly music publishing as well but live music 
music is obviously another live events, but live music uh, might be my concern, been absolutely decimated by this. And I know people involved in the biz who are at the maybe in the you know late hours in the darkness at the in the depths of their mind are beginning to have thoughts coming up about will it ever actually be as it was before um yeah and it's it's a it's a scary thought for people involved um and for those of us who are not involved but enjoy live music but again that's not something that the that the authors really speak about they speak in general terms about um mass events and of course in a more um a political context mass events you know r- rallies uh, political meetings uh people coming out to vote we've already seen all of these things being heavily impacted so again that's another freedom of expression issue um to consider um i'm reminded thinking we're talking about dystopia and about these big societal changes and about an increased role for the state in our lives i'm reminded of the film rollerball not the diabolical remake from whenever like 10 years ago or something but the original 1975, I think it is, film rollerball. Anyway, in that, in that, there's a technocratic society, which is the background setting for, for, the, uh, for the action. And um, the, the vision for society laid out in, in the book really reminds me of that because they have these mega organizations that take care of the needs of the, the global population. Uh, so there's no competition anymore. So they have uh, things like transport, housing, food, um, energy, luxury. These are the big global state. Um, they're not even corporations. They're just organizations that provide these things and you've got nowhere else to go for your energy or your transport. So the vision laid out really reminded me of that. And uh, so again, we look at the history of um, state, exclusive state provision of all those things. It's not exactly uh, covered in um, glorious examples of success, shall we say. So I would say in summary, in terms of like where things are going, whether they're going in that direction sort of as an organic response to, to the pandemic or whether they're being steered and controlled, whether they are new developments we didn't quite foresee, new changes that have suddenly become, you know, uh, talked about or necessary or they're just happening or whether they're changes that have been long planned, long laid out. Um, I would say in summary that the scale and the scope of the human enterprise it has been determined by some needs to be reduced we need to have less people doing less having less consuming less that's the bottom line and there's nothing in the book that really leads me to think that that as a as an ongoing agenda has changed and i see lots of evidence from movement um in that direction on multiple fronts as a counter to that sort of thinking i would refer to um a lot of the shows i've done on legalized freedom in the past have talked about the energy to run a technocratic society you know because we're already seeing despite a huge fall in the oil price and oil consumption during the lockdowns there are many people who've been pointing out that our energy future is very insecure so any technocratic society would be totally reliant on way more energy, you know, an, an automated society, way more energy than we're currently pumping out. And that would have impact, have impacts on climate change. But also if the energy simply is too expensive or becomes unavailable, I don't see how all this stuff is going to run, to be quite honest with you. If you, I recommend a book by my previous radio guest, he's been on with me many times, it's called John Michael Greer and his book, The Long Descent. That is a bit closer to what I expect to see in the next 200 years. You can also find my interview with him on The Long Descent um, here on the YouTube channel or at legalizefreedom.com. We just put John Michael Greer into the search box. You'll find it all there. So, uh, yeah, so that's about the nub of it. COVID-19, the great reset. Uh, Where we go from here remains to be seen, but there's a lot of food for thought here. Um, Hopefully... Uh, for those of you who don't even get round to reading the book. Um, so until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com. LegalizeFreedom.com <laughs>